Welcome, clickers. Where are we going to deal with some of your questions? He printed these off this morning. Press, press, right fresh off from the, the press. Web. Yeah, and there's, uh, there's some good questions here this week. Uh, and, uh, and questions that I could almost answer as well. It mean, must be easy. And why have, they, why have they put them on the site if you can answer them? <laughs> you are the greatest contributor. <laughs> <laughs> Butternut squash. Butternut squash. Butternut squash. And this is a, this is a message from Shed 47. I think I, we may have mentioned Shed 47 before. Perhaps he's one of these regulars, is he? Yeah. He, yeah. she, not sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Anyway, just wondering if anyone could help. My butternut squash is green resembling more of a marrow than a squash. Is it okay to eat or best left alone? Well, the first thing to identify is, is it a butternut squash? Because the members of that family, when you buy them as seedlings, all have very similar leaves and all have very similar growth habits. So you may well have been sold a pup for that. It could well be a marrow. Right. That's always a possibility. <laughs> it could be, couldn't it? Because it, I mean, most of them, it despite be, the... Be, yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen Alby patiently trying to grow a courgette up a string in here because he bought it as a cucumber. So, yeah. you know, these things do look very similar in the infant stage. They do, they do. But, but, I, but I, it, I've grown butternut squashes before, though, and they have looked a little bit marrow-esque. Yes, they are. They're, they're, they're not butternut squash-esque They haven't got the bell shape, then. Yeah, they haven't no, got that, uh, that little in, nice little curve into the, into the ribs. Are they? they haven't and, got that. And they haven't, and from experience, they, they, they weren't worth eating either. In fact, I think we tried one or two, and then subsequently, the rest ended up, uh, I fed them to the chickens. The chickens right. quite like them when they've been cut up, but no, disappointing flavour. But again, a butternut squash really has to get that pale flesh to really look good and know it is ripe. It is. You know that in the centre, and you can always tell when a butternut squash is ready, because it looks supreme, and it's a very pale, creamy colour. It's got that beautiful shape. And they are a very, very difficult vegetable to grow outdoors in this country. They are. I mean, we, 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 unless you get a real tremendous summer, it's going to be great difficulty. And if that is not right on the plant, it isn't going to ripen. So Indeed. I'm afraid you're not going to have the pleasure of tasting your own butternut squash this year. They come for two for a pound in Tesco's. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so condemn the butternut squash. I yeah. think is is the answer. That is. Uh, lots of worms in compost. Now, this is a this is a question dear to my heart. This is from Flowerpot, right. and Flowerpot is asking, uh, in fact, telling us that uh, she or he has lots of pink reddish worms in he or her Dalek shaped compost bin. Uh, they've never had them before. Uh, am I doing something wrong? They are all on the top. I think you're doing something very, very right, don't you? If you've got a good, good population of worms in a compost bin, yeah, it definitely. shows that the, the mixture of the compost is about right. It's not too wet, it's not too dry. The fact that they've gone to the top means that you probably got the lid on. They do tend to congregate on the top when they go down on a little feed, but they do tend to be in the darkness of the bin beyond the top. But again, that's a good sign that you were doing something right if you've got worms in that compost bin. It is. I mean, it, interestingly, one of, the, one of the things that people tend to ask uh, is how um, worms turned up in my compost bin. And, it, and it's not, you know, it's not, it's not uh, an enormously difficult question to answer because quite literally they all travel over land to colonise new space. And the reason those little earthworms are sat on the top of the compost bin is because they like to respire easily and it, you know the air circulating around the lid circulating around the top and because they breathe through their skins that's a comfortable place for them to to gather and accumulate lots of different types of composting worms there are six species which look almost identical and the only way you can tell them apart is to count the segments between the tail and the saddle the proper name for the saddle being the, the clitellum but uh, no one in their right mind is ever going to do that so they tend to be described as little red worms if you've got them in the compost heap all is, is well and good. So, just a job. That was a big biological lesson. There you go. Yeah. I can so, now count all the seconds of my worms and then segregate them. There you go. <laughs> uh, no, no, right, manure. Uh, and this is a question from uh, from who? From uh, Andy Widow Finnis. Oh, Andy Widow Finnis. And uh, so, you know, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a interesting pseudonym. But uh, he or she is asking, can I spread well-rotted horse muck between the rows of my garlic and cabbages, for that matter? 
at this time of year. This time of year being November. November. I assume what the date on that? The image of uh, this was sent over on the 12th of November. So it is it's almost right up to date then? Yeah. Well, I would not, quite frankly, because if you're going to put manure around the garlic and the cabbage at this time of year, it's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to enrich that soil too quickly and it's going to keep it slightly warmer and it's going to encourage lots of new growth during the winter months, which is not what you want. You really want it to be there, making a good root structure, but not make lots of green top. Right. You want it to stay in the ground. And again, the other tendency, even though it's well rotted, was if it's coming into contact with both the, spring, the greens and with the garlic itself, there will be a tendency that it may well cause some rot or some baritis or some other complaints. Manure is best done, if you've got open ground, yes, spread it on, ready for preparation for next year. But the best time, in my view, to dig money in to improve the soil is early in the spring. Because we gain mostly wet winters, and again the manure then is washing away. If you're going to spread it on, then put something over the top to cover it. Let the earthworms take it down, and then you're maintaining that goodness. But if you spread it on willy-nilly, the rains will fall, it'll leach into the ground, and it'll have a tendency to leach away. I think you're absolutely right, because I've tried exactly the same thing myself. I've, I've mulched the ground with horse manure in the autumn and covered it over and actually when you take the covers off what you end up with is a wonderful kind of friable well worked surface but there's very little nutrient in the ground actually yeah. when you need it i.e. the, the beginning the of the growing season the following right. year That's so right. you're kind of almost wasting that manure and you, you know there's, there's obviously a certain amount of effort involved in getting the manure onto the ground so yeah i think it's probably yeah. just as well don't not, do it not no, if you leave, leave it leave it to yeah. later on in the growing season if you're out in the open there then manure in the new year is far better applied than it is in the autumn these days i uh, i sent away for some uh, raspberries the other day for my mother who'd seen a, an advert mm -hmm. in, a, in a newspaper for some raspberry canes i sent right. away for these raspberries and they and they turned up and uh, and then you know she's she's planted them out at this time of year. Question here uh, from Ronald Fraser asking whether or not they can easily tear apart the roots of the raspberry canes that they've been sent through the post. Yeah, that's the way to treat them. I mean, there's, when you buy raspberry canes, they are bare rooted. Treat them like you treat them white. They are your wife. That's right. You've got to treat them rough. A bit rough, <laughs> but with respect. <laughs> <laughs> rough with with respect, but tear them apart. Put them in in a well prepared area, broken up, plenty of manure worked in ready, and they'll be very happy. And then come the spring, they'll start to send up their green growth. And it depends whether they are an early summer, summer or autumn fruiting crop. Because yeah. again, raspberries can be different varieties of fruit over a very long period. Yeah. So again, it depends which one you've got. I, th I think the main concern was that, yeah, is, is he or she likely to need to treat them with kid gloves? No, or absolutely they not. A they, bit rough? they are bare rooted tear them apart, as long as there's a good root structure on, put them down just below the eel under the ground, and then they will, they will quite happily grow away and make you a fantastic crop of raspberries from year on to eternity. Fantastic. Well, I think that pretty much That's rounds it. up the question and answer session for this, uh, this month. Right. And essentially we look forward to some more juicy questions next month. Perhaps some, some Christmassy questions. I don't know, you know, we'll leave that to your imaginations. Mm, that should be interesting. Christmasy Christmas Christmas Christmasy Christmas. Easy for you to say. In the vegetable garden. <laughs> so it's bye from us. Right, yeah, bye.